Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Hydrogen Deuterium Exchange Coupled with Cyclic Ion Mobility for Higher Quality Analyses. I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of LCGC, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're pleased to bring you this webcast presented by LCGC and Biofarm International and sponsored by Waters. Waters Corporation is a world-leading specialty measurement company focused on improving human health and well-being through the application of high-value analytical technologies and industry-leading scientific expertise. Driven by that ethos for over 60 years, Waters has continually pioneered chromatography, mass spectrometry, and thermal analysis innovations. Whether it's discovering new pharmaceuticals, ensuring the safety of the world's food and water supplies, or ensuring the integrity of a chemical entity in production, Waters is constantly working with their more than 40,000 customers to change the world. Before we get started today, we have a few housekeeping announcements. First, the webcast is designed to be interactive, so we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box, and you can find that on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation today, please click on the question mark Help widget in the dock at the bottom of your window. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to ask everyone in the audience to participate in two brief polling questions. Please click directly on the screen to enter your answers. So here's the first question, which is up on your screen. Are you currently looking to upgrade your HDX system? Yes, no, or looking to enter HDX MS? So once again, you can click directly on the screen to enter your answers. And that question is, are you currently looking to upgrade your HDX system? Yes, no, or looking to enter HDX MS? Excellent. Thank you for taking your first poll. So let's now go to our second polling question. And once again, you can click directly on the screen to enter your answers. And here's that question. What orthogonal structural characterization techniques are you currently using? NMR, X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy, differential scanning calorimetry, circular dichroism, native mass spectrometry. So once again, what orthogonal structural characterization techniques are you currently using? NMR, X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy, differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC, circular dichroism, or CD, or native MS. Excellent. Thank you all very much for taking that second polling question. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. We're very pleased to be joined today by Lindsay Morrison. Lindsay Morrison currently works in separations research at Waters Corporation. She received her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Colorado College and joined Jennifer Broadbelt's lab at the University of Austin to focus on using UBPD for characterization of peptides, glycolipids, and native proteins. Lindsay, thank you for joining us today. Please get us started. Hi, thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Today, I'm pleased to talk to you about some of the research that I got to get, a, get started on a little bit last year. Um, so this all started when we got our cyclic IMS mass spectrometer into the Beverly Demo Lab last year. That happened in January, and we had it for about a month before the entire world shut down. Um, so we were very excited from the get-go because we knew that the cyclic IMS would be a great fit for hydrogen deuterium exchange. And we were really enthusiastic to see how much benefit we could get out of the new aspect. Unfortunately, with the closures due to the pandemic, it took us almost nine months to get back into the lab to actually be able to complete some of these experiments. So after all of that time, I'm really thrilled to talk to you today about how that work actually panned out. So the theme for what I'm going to show you today is really exemplified by this picture here of the same bolt, which is really better, stronger, faster, more which is really everything cyclic IMS offers for the hydrogen deuterium experiment. The one is a perfect fit for the other, allowing you to run at a faster rate, get better data, and have better, stronger results. What the cyclic IMS offers, um, which I think is really uh, well framed by thinking about this in terms of what I'm going to call here pepsin omics. So many of you are probably familiar with the feature, whereas you go from a relatively small protein, such as my myoglobin here on the far left side of the screen, towards larger and larger proteins and protein complexes, 
because of the number of cut sites that Pepsin has, so it can cut uh, next to hydrophobic residues as well as some other um, other residues such as threonine, serine, you get an increasing number of peptides as you go larger and larger. And so this relatively linear relationship doesn't account for modifications and it doesn't account for non-specific cut sites as well. And so what you're really looking at here is an underestimation of how many peptides you can generate. You can easily see that you get towards 500 kilodaltons of protein mass. You're looking at upwards of 3 to 3,500 uh, peptides that are being generated. Now combine that with the HDX experiment where we're trying to analyze those peptides as quickly as possible and you really start to run into some analytical challenges really, really quickly. And so for me as an analytical chemist, I find this really interesting and an interesting challenge to try to overcome. And you can think about doing it in a variety of ways. One would be improving your chromatography or slowing down your back exchange by cooling that chromatography, which is absolutely an avenue that various people have explored. And the other is faster. And the use of a high-end spectrometer really does enable this type of work to be done. And so the focus of what I'm going to talk to you today is really about the cyclic IMS mass spectrometer, which of course has the scalable cyclic ion mobility cell, which allows for effectively infinite resolution uh, with some temporal constraints in the ion mobility domain. And so the idea here is that you couple the chromatography with a better separation in the ion mobility domain and perhaps you can start to improve your analysis and retain more deuterium, so on and so forth. But the other benefits that come from the cyclic and mobility are really listed in points two through four here. And so those really come from some of the other hardware modifications that were made from that system. So it is, in fact, a superior mass spectrometer relative to the Synaptic XS. The reasons for that include the XS transfer device here, which is going to improve the sensitivity of the system as well as the back end top. It has the same footprint as the zone object does, but it has a modified ion detection that has tremendous benefits for HDX. And I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. So let's start a little bit about the methodology that I followed today. And so generally speaking, I'm going to be talking about phosphorylated B, and I'm going to be referring to peptide identification following filtering and dynamics and sequence coverage is performance metrics for how well we're handling more and more peptides or more peptides in a shorter period of time. Generally, I used a seven minute gradient with a 40 microliter per minute flow rate, um, but you'll see at the end that I eventually switched to a little bit of a faster flow rate of 60 microliters per minute and also truncated that gradient down to a three minute. I used uh, 32, 16, and eight picomol per microliter stock solutions for the sensitivity assessment. And these were done with an automated workflow using a 1 to 20 dilution into the E buffer, followed by a 1 to 1 dilution into the quench buffer, as would typically be done. To give you a flavor of what it looks like to set up an ion mobility experiment on cyclic IMS, I've taken a screenshot from the IMS tune page here. And so I'm showing you the two path methodology that I've set up. And so you can see a number of voltages here on the left hand side that control things like the traveling wave height and velocity. And then on the center screen, we can see a series of voltages for a pre-array store, the array with the cyclic race track above it, and then a post-array store behind it. And really, the meat of this comes down below, where we can set different separation times for the different events that occur. We have a certain amount of time allocated for the ions to be pushed into the array, and then we're giving them a certain amount of time to separate in the cyclic ion mobility race track. And this really defines how many passes they're going to do. So with this particular method, with a 25 millisecond uh, separation time, most of the ions are going to be doing two passes of the cyclic ion mobility cell, and so I'm nominally calling this a two-pass method. Now, most of you will know that with a peptic-type digestion, we get a wide variety of pep peptides in terms of length, charge state, num over z, and so many of these peptides will be doing three loops of the racetrack, and some of them may only do one. And so bear that in mind as we go throughout. It doesn't matter for any of the processing. What really matters is that we're getting the best separation that we can in a given period of time. And so if you look into the upper right-hand corner of the screen, we can see that the total cycle time for this entire experiment, so from beginning to end of the mobility, is still only 48 milliseconds. So we can actually do about 10 different fills of the mobility cell in a single scan, which gives us a tremendous amount of sensitivity. 
The filters that I referred to before, I'm going to call the Sorensen filters. They come from this Jasmus paper that was published in 2018. And really the key, fil key features of these filters are the file threshold. So I did triplicate injections, and so that means that a peptide had, had to be identified in each of the three replicates in order for it to be counted towards any of the statistics that I'm going to show you in the subsequent slide. So it's a very stringent filter. Um, there's pros and cons to doing it this way, but it does guarantee that only the most reproducible peptides are counted towards the final statistics. And so to start with, I'm going to talk about one of the most basic elements of a mass spectrometer, and that's sensitivity. And again, this is going to come from the excess transfer device. So this is a segmented quadrupole type of hardware. It was originally found in our Zevo G2 XS, and it provides better focusing of the ions as they move into the toughness analyzer. What this allows for is better spatial cohesion of the beam, providing a better mass resolution, but it also allows us to capture more of that beam, meaning that we get better sensitivity out in the end. And so to do this comparison, I ran a 32 picomol per microliter stock solution on my old Synapse G2FI, a newer Synapse G2XS, and the cyclic ability mass spectrometer. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the Sorensen filtered number of peptides using three, these three different mass specs as well as the filtered sequence coverage on the right. In a typical experiment on the G2FI, we would see about 250 peptides, corresponding to about 90% sequence coverage, which you can see well reflected here. Moving to the Synapse XS from about two years ago, we saw a fairly significant increase by about a third of the total number of peptides identified, which gave us about a total of 400 and almost 100% sequence coverage for phosphorylase B at this particular loading. Now, moving to the more sensitive cyclic excess, we again see a fairly tremendous jump in the signal and the number of peptides that we can observe. And here we're seeing 550 to about 600 peptides, corresponding to 100% sequence coverage. Now, it's worth mentioning here that I processed all of these data using the exact same processing settings, which isn't necessarily fair to the cyclic IMS, as you do need to tweak the settings a little bit to account for the improved resolution. And so I did a subsequent study looking at various loading, and here I did modify those processing parameters. So you'll see that on the far left side, our 32 picomol per microliter stock solution is here giving us about 600 peptides, again corresponding to 100% sequence coverage. We see when we half the stock solution that we see a little bit better than half of the number of peptides, still corresponding to 90 to 95% sequence coverage. Interestingly, when we have it again to now 8 picomoles per microliter, we're still seeing tremendous numbers of peptides and tremendous sequence coverage. So we're still able to sample some of those relatively low abundance uh, peptides, even though we're adding less onto the column. And so this is going to allow your starting solutions to go further and require less general material for an entire experiment. The next thing I want to talk about is really related to the isotopic fidelity. And this is, I'm this is related to the sensitivity of the instrument, in particular to the dynamic range. And so one of the features that we tend to see with ion mobility instruments is the sort of relationship where we get pulsing because of the ion mobility experiment. And so what I mean by this is if we think of a chromatographic peak as a distribution of ions in time, at the center of that peak, we're going to get a certain concentration that is relatively high. And that detector is going to see the highest number of ions per push in the center of that chromatographic peak. Relatively straightforward. When we perform the ion mobility experiment, each set of ions is pulsed into the ion mobility cell, which separates and concentrates the ion beam into these narrower pulse regions. So a range of ions that might elute over, let's say, half a second is now compressed into a few milliseconds. And what that ends up with is that your ions per push becomes higher in the ion mobility experiment, even though the total number of ions are the same. And so one of the features that comes from this is something that we call ringing or peak saturation. And that's really exemplified in this uh, figure here. So on the left-hand side, we see a charge state. And if it's a doubly or a triply charge, and you can see the compression of the isotopic profile, where the isotope on the far left is almost equal in intensity to the next one over in the deuterium uptake. If we look at the much lower abundance charge state on the right, these are the exact same peptides, we can see that the ratios between the two ions are somewhat different. And so because of these two charge states, we see a difference in the measured uptake between the individual charge states, which 
or which causes our error bars for the experiment to be much, much wider. While there's a number of practical ways of overcoming this problem, you can unassign a single charge state, you can do things like dynamic range enhancement with the mass spectrometer, none of them are completely perfect. And the ideal way to handle this is to have something called a dual gain detector. And that's exactly what was incorporated into the cyclic INS. In the dual gain detector, you have two side-by-side uh, -side detection systems, one that operates at a low gain, which allows you to detect very highly abundant ions with a high degree of fidelity. And then you have a high gain detection system that allows you to detect the lower abundance things, also with a high degree of fidelity. These two split electronic circuits are then merged back together, and the data are pieced back together without the user even knowing what's going on. And so the way that that looks for the cyclic INS is really shown and exemplified here on this slide. On the bottom of these two figures, I have two peptides, and you can see that they're both relatively abundant. And we see a number of artificial peaks that we call ringing, as well as a high degree of saturation, especially at that second isotope on the right-hand side. Now, if we compare this to the isotope distribution for the same ions generated for the cyclic INS, we can see a tremendous amount of difference in the retention of the proper isotopic profile. And so you can compare this to the isotope model shown on the top, where we see the cyclic almost perfectly recapitulates what we would expect based on modeling. So this has been a problem that uh, people have talked to me about for a number of years, and so it's really nice to be able to walk away from isotope ringing and detector saturation without really having to do anything. And it might be my favorite aspect of the cyclic IMS to date. So last but not least, I'm going to talk about the mobility resolution. And this, of course, is the core of the cyclic IMS instrument. And it's really the most analytically interesting component that we're going to see today. And so for the next experiments, I'm going to show you a little bit of a different method, or I'm going to use a little bit of a different method uh, to kind of exemplify what we can do. And so here I'm using two different methods one with a seven-minute gradient and one with a three-minute gradient, increased our BSN flow rate to 60 microliters a minute just to try to really expedite getting those peptides off the column. The stock solution I used was the 16 picomole per microliter, and I did two different MS methods, one with one pass of the cyclic and the second with two passes. To give you an idea of what those chromatograms look like, on the top you can see the three-minute separation, on the bottom is the seven, and so you can see by compressing that chromatography, we get an increased number of peptides coalluding with one another. And we also start to see a little bit of suppression of the uh, peak signal due to ionization effects. And so I recently moved into a separations research group. And so I started to think about chromatography a little bit differently. And one of the ways that traditional chromatographers really think about a separation is in the terms of peak capacity. And so peak capacity can be defined for experimental data by the equation shown on the upper right here, which is simply one plus the gradient length divided by the peak width at the four sigma peak width, which is really basically the base, base or 13% above the base. And so using that type of an approach, I took 10 different peptides from the seven minute separation and calculated what would be the four sigma peak capacity for this particular separation. And that came out to about 84 which means that we can about baseline resolve 84 different species using this particular method. Now, 84 is not very many. However, we don't just have a simple chromatograph. We also have a mass spectrometer on the back end. And in fact, in order to calculate these numbers correctly, we have to start to think about the way that the apex processing behind the scenes is really working. So if an MSE and an HDMSE type of an experiment, we're using the LC separation on the front end to help separate and differentiate our ion. The mass spectrometer is scanned on a low energy scan and an elevated energy scan in which we're fragmenting the peptides. These two things oscillate back and forth very rapidly, allowing us to get very good peak definition across the chromatogram. If we then go into the data and take the extracted ion chromatogram of every single precursor and every single fragment ion, what we end up seeing is that the fragment ions will have the exact same chromatographic profile as their respective precursors. And even those with a high degree of overlap, such as the pink and the gray ion here, can be very easily separated by centroiding these very well-defined uh, extracted ion chromatogram. And this is precisely what the apex and peptide algorithms in our PLGS software are doing. So having spent a fair amount of time with these two algorithms over the past year, 
I can, with a high degree of confidence, tell you that they're quite easily capable of separating and defining the fragments for these two overlapping peptides. And so if you follow with your eyes, you can see that the one on the left eludes at about 5.455, and the one on the right, or the one on the left eludes at 5.445. So it's a difference of less than 0 0.01 minutes. And if you look at this in terms of the peak width, it's actually about 0.38 of a sigma, where sigma is the um, standard deviation of that Gaussian peak. And so for simplicity here, we're going to assume safely that we need at least half of the standard deviation or half of the sigma to actually differentiate these two things. But we can reapply this sort of threshold back to that formula to see how many peaks we can actually separate in an MSE type separation. So using this type of strategy, again applying this equation, we now get to an MSE based peak capacity of about 662. If we think back to that pepsinomics diagram that I showed you on the front page, a B generates 523 unmodified peptides. And so these two numbers are actually pretty ballpark. If we think about what we can do with a Zevo G2XS type mass spec, that's going to give us about 85 to 90% sequence coverage with the seven minute gradient, which is pretty representative when we start to consider uh, cleavage sites that aren't accounted for by this theoretical digest. It also starts to tell us that if we need to go to proteins that are significantly larger than phosphorylase B, or if we want to truncate that chromatographic gradient, we need more separation power. And of course, the way to do that with this instrument is to apply the ion mobility. And so typically with ion mobility, we're going to perform an ion mobility se separation here, either in a synapse or in the racetrack on the cyclic ion mobility cell. And then we're going to perform fragmentation afterwards so that we can time align the fragments in the mobility dom domain just as we would the chromatographic. So the way that this looks, in an HDMSC experiment um, can kind of be exemplified by thinking about the data in this way. So on this particular figure, we have M over Z on the x-axis, and we have drift time on the Y. And so with the Y, or with the one pass data, you can see here that we have a fairly linear relationship. We see these streaking charge states corresponding to one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus charge state series. And on the two plus we see a, or two pass series, we see a better utilization of that space. We can see that we do have some ions that are lapping more than once, and we can see some of these other effects. But the important thing to note here is that if we look up towards the higher uh, drift times, we see that the peak widths are significantly wider than they are at the lower drift times. And this really comes from the fact that we're looking at a gas phase separation where diffusion is a very, very dominant feature. And so to deal with this, we have to make a calibration. And this calibration relates the drift time of the peak, so where it eludes in drift time space, to its peak width. And you can see that it's not a super tight correlation, but it allows us to estimate for the one pass and for the two pass experiments how many peaks we can reasonably separate using those two different methods. And so using, again, the four sigma peak capacity approach, we get a peak capacity of about 26.1 for the one-pass experiment and about 41 for the two-pass. But of course, we're performing HDMSC, which is a multidimensional apex processing. So not only do we perform apex on the chromatographic dimension, but we can also perform apex in the drift dimension. And because we're fragmenting after the mobility cell, this allows us to do basically two time alignment steps and get very, very clean spectra. And so having, again, spent a fair amount of time with this type of data, it's relatively reasonable to separate these two overlapping species here on the left, where you can see about a delta of a quarter of a millisecond, corresponding to about one standard deviation of a Gaussian peak. And to just demonstrate for you the effect of uh, the separation going from one pass to two passes, even though we are uh, experiencing longer drift times and thus more diffusion, you can see with the two-pass data, we're getting a superior separation for these singly charged ions. And so using this one sigma in our peak capacity calculation, we get a peak capacity HDMSC for the one-pass data of about 100 and about 160 for the two-pass data. Now that allows us to bring it all together. For orthogonal separation, to get a two-dimensional peak capacity, we simply multiply the first dimension by the second dimension which here is simply going to be that MSE times that HDMSE value. 
And so for seven minutes, one pass separation, we're looking at a theoretical maximum peak capacity of about 66,000 ions. So a little bit of hand waving going on here because we can identify two things that overlap with one another. We'll just have fragments that sort of uh, lay on top of one another. But generally speaking, it allows us to compare what type of mobility experiment we need in order to achieve uh, the same degree of separation with a shorter chromatographic gradient. And so here we can see that going to a two-pass experiment with the seven-minute gradient allows us to theoretically see 100,000 different species. If we go down to a three-minute gradient, we can see that with a two-minute or two-pass mobility experiment, a three-minute chromatographic gradient, we can almost resolve as many peaks as we could with the seven-minute one-pass experiment. And of course, as we go down to one minute, we see a further reduction in those values. So now we can look and see how this is borne out in the actual data and see what it looks like. And so I've done this for a number of proteins so far. Unfortunately, I can really only show it to you for phosphorylase B at the moment, but do believe me when I say that I've uh, looked at more than just one protein. And so here, looking at a uh, seven minute gradient with one pass and two passes, we're observing about 350 peptides, which comes out to about 92, 93% sequence coverage, as I showed you before. When we reduced to the three-minute gradient with one pass and with two passes, we do see a reduction in the number of peptides that we're able to identify. However, we're still getting good separation, and we're still observing in more species than we would otherwise. We're not completely having this number, for example. And when we look at this in terms of sequence coverage, we see that our coverage is still above 90% with the one-pass method, and that we're actually up at about 95% with that two-pass method. The performance of the system is looking pretty good. Um, I have other proteins where this looks actually even better. And it seems to indicate that we can start to use shorter and shorter chromatographic gradients to try to save time. And by saving time, this is going to allow us to do several things with the system. First, it's going to allow for better deuterium retention, which is, of course, critical to an HDX experiment. Second, it allows for higher throughput, allowing for labs to process this type of data much more quickly. Instead of maybe three or four protein complexes a week, you could start to do five, six, or seven. And so there's a tremendous amount of benefit that comes from doing this, especially if you work in a lab that is budget constrained or time restrained. The other benefits of the cyclic IMS, of course, are the sensitivity and the dual gain ADC, which is going to allow you to load less material, spend less time in your processing, trying to sort out that charge state effects from peak saturation and other effects. And that is all I have today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay, for that excellent presentation. It is now time to begin the question and answer period. As a reminder to everyone in the audience, if you would like to submit a question, you can do that by typing it in the Q&A box, and you can find that on the right-hand side of your window. All right, so we've got a few questions coming in. Let's get started. Um, let's get started with this one, Lindsay. How many, on slide nine, how many of those peptides are peptides, oops, sorry, just moved on me, um, where you can actually follow the deuterium incorporation? Hi, Laura. Thanks. Great question. Um, before we get started in answering, I just want to highlight an adjacent webinar that's happening later uh, in the month in April. So on April 28th, there's an IMS webinar series uh, from Mark Scahill talking about expanding the subunit complexity of HDX in this experiment. So for those of you interested in the topic, uh, please tune into that. And as for the peptide question, this is actually a really good one. As anyone who has done some manual curation of an HDX experiment well knows, oftentimes you end up having to throw things out simply because of uh, isotope overlap and some other reasons. And so with this, I haven't quantified to a finite number what the number is that you do have to throw out. So you'll still have issues with incorrect peptide assignments as you would with any other um, search strategy, and those ones will also probably have to be removed. Now going through the data manually and just trying to find uh, isotope signatures that did overlap with one another, the resolution of the instrument is so good and the mobility resolution is so good that I actually was really hard pressed to do so. I think I found one example of the entire data set that I looked at. Um, so theoretically, very, very few. There will obviously be cases in certain situations where that's higher, 
uh, but for at least this particular experiment, it was relatively low. Excellent. Can you explain how you calculate peak capacity of LC IMS and LC IMS? Sure. So this is actually a very philosophical question. It can be calculated from uh, theoretical data based on things like temperature, column capacity, and things like that. And that actually tends to give you somewhat of a higher number than you would calculate using the rather experimental approach that I use, which is that equation where you have one plus the uh, uh, delta width uh, effectively of the square root n, and I have that in front of me. And so that I used for both um, uh, the gradient width over the uh, peak width at four sigma. And so that was what I used for both the mobility and for the chromatography. For the chromatography, because your peak width tend to be relatively consistent over the entire gradient profile, I was able to take the average of just the 10 of those particular peptides that I looked at. For the ion mobility domain, because you have peak broadening associated with longer dilution times, that was really where having a calibration curve, so to speak, or a weighted calibration curve, where you assume effectively an equal weighting across the entire mobility range. Of course, this is not happen in all experiments, or even any, it's a theoretical assumption. Uh, but it gives you an estimate of what the max peak, peak capacity for a nine mobility experiment would be. Thank you. Can we still couple a leap pal robot for automated HDX time course experiments? Absolutely. And I absolutely did for all of these experiments shown here. Great. What would be an ideal minimum product for AA criteria in dynamics? So I typically use either 0.1 or 0.3, depending on uh, how rich my data set is. So I'll use uh, 0.3 products per amino acid in kind of the relatively stringent criteria. If it looks like I'm missing certain peptides just because they don't produce enough fragments or other reasons, then I would uh, decrease that to something like 0.1. Has gas phase back exchange been evaluated yet? That's a great question. And the answer to that is sort of twofold. And yes, it has, and it looks like it's quite good on the instrument. We don't see any increase in back exchange with additional passes going around the mobility cell. And it does appear that looking at sort of these enhanced or uh, faster chromatographic gradients, we get better performance in terms of the overall back exchange of the experiment. How frequently, frequently and under what conditions do you recommend running back exchange experiments? For example, if I change the number of passes in the cyclic from two to four, should I rerun my back exchange test? As far as we can tell, that is not necessary. Um, so we ran some initial preliminary experiments with intact phosphorylase B a couple of years ago, and it, after 10 to 15 passes, the deuterium incorporation is still the same. And with the experiments that I've run here with an LC gradient and all of those sorts of things, we see no difference between the one and the two past data in terms of the back exchange. So just one, Are you using un Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you using Unify or MassLink? This is MassLink. So the cyclic is built on a relatively unique interface that sort of patches a quartz interface, which is what the instrument runs on, into a mass link. That way you can run your LC and all of your other um, front ends in the same way that you normally would off of a mass link system. How good is the HTMSE method in terms of quantification compared to the typical MRM method? That's a good question. So your MRM is going to give you more specificity. Uh, the HDMSE utilizes no quadrupole isolation, and so there's always more room for interfering species. However, with the improved mobility resolution, as well as the improvements to the uh, dual-gain ADC, we should get better quantification. That being said, I haven't done the side-by-side -side comparison, particularly for HDX. In a few of the comparison graphs, you show fewer peptides identified, but better sequence coverage. Why do you think that is? So one of the criteria that we use to select our peptide database is the requirement that all peptides be independently identified in three of the replicate injections. 
This is incredibly stringent and all it requires is a single replicate to have um, one particularly low level peptide or a fragment that goes awry and doesn't get quite detected as it should and that peptide effectively drops out. So there's a little bit of variability in using a filter of this kind. Um, there's other ways to do it, but we particularly like this approach at water because it guarantees that your peptide pool that you're using is very, very reproducible. Um, but it does add a little bit of variability here. So for some of the low-level peptides, you might see in a particular three of three replicate set, um, one peptide there, and then it might be out in the next one. And that's sort of that fringe on the line of uh, sensitivity for the peptides that we're detecting. How confident can we be, can we be for glycosylated peptide IDs? This is an extremely difficult question, in particular um, with HDX because of the false discovery rate associated with a peptic digest. Um, as we get towards better fragmentation of glycosylated peptides, either by electron-based methods or in some cases by collisional-based methods, we can improve the confidence of those identifications. And if you search a smaller pool form, that also does improve um, that particular metric. However, it is still challenging at this time. And I, there's a reason I didn't address it too much in this talk, and that's because I didn't have an electron-based method, which really uh, helps that quite a bit. Um, I think using appropriate false discovery approaches for glycopeptides is really key, and I think this is one of the main areas for future work that needs to be done. What standards or standard HDX experiments do you suggest running and why? So my favorite two standard proteins are phosphorylase B and enolase, mostly because I've run them all the time. You can use whatever standard you want as long as you know how it performs and how well it performs. And so phosphorylase B is commercially available. It doesn't have any disulfide bonds, which is handy for eliminating any effects that may result from BSEP degradation over time. And so I typically will look for a sequence coverage metric with phosphorylase B to guarantee that my pepsin column and some of the other parameters on the system are performing adequately. I'll then usually do an uptake experiment to guarantee that my buffers are meeting the right criteria for um, uh, de deuterating the phosphorylase B. And then from time to time, I'll run an analyze standard to make sure that my back exchange for my system is also appropriate. What is the internal standard recommended for LCMS, and what corrections does this provide? What are your best practice guidelines for its use? So typically for an HDX experiment, we're not really running an internal standard in the sense that we would for a quantitative type experiment. And that's because the signal intensity that we're looking for in HDX is all tends to be relative. We, in fact, don't really care how much signal we get out of the peptides in terms of the y-axis scale, but rather how they calibrate on the x-axis in terms of how much deuterium uptake there is. And for that reason, it's all relative, and so we don't tend to use an internal standard. There are cases where you can do this for trying to measure more precise reaction rates at the different anodes, but that is a whole uh, talk in and of itself. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for your excellent talk and for answering all those questions. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I also want to thank our sponsor, Waters, for making today's webcast possible. You'll receive an email alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who might have missed today's live event. We hope to see you all next time. Goodbye.